is I think you are were the funniest of the companions. I don't know what other people think, but I think the dynamic between you and Tom and that lovely shall I kill him doctor and all of that kind of you know that there's a really you were such a smart character and also you know the savagery as well. And so I think you know comedy for you has been something you know you started in Marty Feldman's comedy machine was one of the first things you did. It was. I had one line, which was, dead cats turn me on. <laughs> um, and my agent said, um, if you've got a punchline, give me a call because you get more money. So I rang her up and I said, this is the line. She said, is it a punchline? I said, absolutely no idea. But when it went out, they canned in some laughter on the end of it. So obviously it was. I was painting his toenails when I said it. <laughs> Marty Feldman. Oh, what a genius. Oh, and what a gentle man. I mean, he at one line I had, you know, he's hot out of drama college. He came over and introduced himself as if you didn't know who he was, you know, and um, was just sweet and kind and lovely and welcoming and just put me at my ease. Yeah, lovely. There is, if someone hasn't made a t-shirt saying dead cats turn me on by the end of this weekend, this has not been a proper gathering as far as I'm concerned. That is, there's a lovely story, I can't remember if we've talked about this before, but I, Marty, the, the autobiography that he wrote, which was hidden in an attic for 30 years, and it has an afterward where it talks about when Graham Chapman was trying to keep him alive when he was dying. And his final words were, and um, Loretta is his wife who he loved so much, and he said, please tell my wife I'm so glad that I met her because it meant I never had to put my thing in anyone else. As far as the lines go, that's that, that, you know, filled with love, and then a bit of sauce at the end, because I'm a comic as well. So in, in terms of that sense of the dynamic, because I, it, it does feel to me very much like a double act that you have, have, have with Tom. There was, there was a real rhythm. You, you were not a companion who was there just to kind of help the explanation and be the bridge towards the audience. You know, there, there, there was a, an incredible dynamic. And how did that build up? That's so kind of you to say. Tom, you know, it's no secret that Tom and I are, weren't the best of friends back in the day. He was, in, he was incredibly difficult to work with. I, I have to say immediately, I absolutely adore him now. We got on incredibly well and we do loads of big Finnish work together. I've written for him, actually. Um, we get on incredibly well. So, but whatever wasn't right back in the 70s, what was right was the on-screen relationship because we always had uh, respect for each other's work um, in, in a way that you don't always have with your compatriots. So, uh, and when we were building something up or reworking a bit of script, which you don't really have time for now like you used to back in the day, we'd have 10 days rehearsal, so we would rework something, improvise something. There was one moment where I, I don't know, I trod on his scarf, and he just went, Leela, unscripted, Leela, I stopped, yes, get off my scarf. Yeah. And off we went, and of course the crew absolutely fell about and kept it in, and it was fine. So we had that kind of simpatico going. I'm not sure it was exploited enough, you know, this sort of Higgins and Eliza Doolittle relationship. Yeah. I think that would have, we could have taken that a lot further talents when Cheyenne was the one that investigated that most. I mean, we, we, we literally, you know, his, his, when, you know, when I appeared in that dress, it was, it was Tom's idea to have his breath taken away, seeing Leela in a, that wasn't in the script, that was just Tom going, wow. It was, you know, delicate little moments like that, which were his genius, really. And so when you were going in to work on an average day, I mean, when you first went in, for instance, the first day, when did you start sizing up the fact that you could feel there was a, 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 the tension there, the dynamic uh, between you? Um, I think the tension was there. <laughs> well, the very first day's filming, um, weirdly, so, so this is in the days where we mixed film with video, so weirdly, the first day's work I had with Tom uh, hadn't been rehearsed, and it was the my very first scene. It's true then, the evil one eats babies. It was that scene. Um, and I had one or two suggestions which were immediately squashed. And then the wonderful Pennant Roberts, 
sadly, very sadly, no longer with us, uh, who remained a friend all the way through, um, kind of stepped in and used a little bit of Tom's ideas and a little bit of my ideas and slowly, so then we got the script going off the page and then I thought, oh yeah, this is going to work, from that very first scene onwards. And then when, when you, you weren't working, that was just, the, the, there was no... Kind of, we'd all pop down the pub. It was a real drinking culture in the 70s. I mean, a lot of lunch times were spent in the pub. Um, so it was a lot, and Thomas is a fantastic raconteur. How many of you have seen him here? Yeah, nearly all of you, yeah. I mean, he is extraordinary. Have you interviewed him? No, I haven't. Oh, you just have to ask one question, and then you sit back for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> He's just amazing like that. And you don't know what's true and what isn't, and what's plagiarised and what isn't. <laughs> but he's lived a life, that man. I love the religious stuff. I remember watching something where he was talking about when he fell out with religion and he just has this line where he goes, you know, this rubbish about the meat shall inherit the earth. Yes, but how long will they manage to hold on to it for? <laughs> you know, that's a kind of very wonderful, deep way of looking at that. So, so in, in that, I mean, also you have this thing which was the clash between you are one of the strongest female characters in a time where the, there was a sense of, you know, spare rib and, 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 and there was a sense of, of hopefully an increasing empowerment, which is tragic is still having to go on, but you also, your the costume you have, so there seems to be this kind of, so how did you feel about that? You've both got this incredibly strong character, but they go, well, we're obviously, because of strong character, you better wear these, just this. Yeah, something for the dance, as Phil, <laughs> Philip Hinchcliffe, you know, famously said. At the time, I was uh, very naive, I think. I thought it would be, it, I didn't feel it was gratuitous then. I felt, you know, if she lives in the jungle, she'd wear animal skins, because she would, it's a very hot climate, she wouldn't wear much. Yeah, fine. I'm going into a kid's TV show, but of course it goes on after the football results. <laughs> two and a half million more on the viewing figures. And I, I, I'd like to think it was my astounding acting that did that. <laughs> I suspect it was the costume. So, you know, Philip's a canny producer, what can I say? And when did you realise, I mean, did you know the, the, the impact it would have? No. Uh, so so when, you, when you went into that, how, what was your, your awareness of how important Doctor Who was to so many people? I had, first of all, I had absolutely no idea it would attract so much attention, you know, the costume. Um, what has, over the years, and this, this feeling has, has gathered and gathered and gathered, and, and, uh, and it may sound corny and cliche and all the rest of it, but the inclusivity of a show like Doctor Who and the and the tolerance and the wisdom and the morality and the and the generosity of the show it it, it knocks me sideways every time every time I'm in a gathering like this and the, and the number of people you know I've talked to Colin about this the number of people that go you know Doctor Who sa saved me it saved me when I thought because it's if, you, if ever you felt, and I know I have, and I suspect most people have at some point, completely outside of things, not included, everybody's got it right except me, what am I doing, you know, I'll hand in my equity card, all that rubbish that goes on in your head. One episode of Doctor Who, you just see, oh, it's all right, they're lads, they go, there's, everything's wonderful there, we can be included, nothing is, nothing is off limits. If you're kind and you're curious, which basically are the two traits of the Doctor, then I, if everybody was, we wouldn't be in the state we're in now, would we? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's... I find that I do a lot of library events and bookshop events at the moment, and they're just the loveliest people in the world. Because you have a new book. I do have a new book. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's not my gig, it's your gig, it's your gig. It's um, got a new book, but, 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 it, it, <laughs> but you know, when I think about that, the Doctor Who books were so important. They were something that when you were, you know, and, and I, I wonder about your first experience. You know, there's that lovely story that, that Tom talks about being stopped on Oxford Street 
by a man who said, um, sorry to bother you, but I was in a care home in the 1970s and it was really, really tough, but every Saturday we had you. As exactly as you were saying, you know, this, this sense, and I, I know that Graham Garden told me a similar story in Australia where they were approached by the Tim, and the Tim were approached by this huge man in a vest holding a beer, and they were kind of thinking they were going to be mugged, and he just said, I grew up in a tough town, and my dad was a really nasty man, but my sisters and my mum, we had your show. And that, I wondered your first experiences of having those conversations with people, where people were prepared to open up and say, you helped get us through a bad time. My most, um, Sophie and I thought we'd collect these stories and put them into a book, you know. We did, we had, we did start, and uh, both our lives have got so busy, we haven't actually followed it through, but it's still on the back burner. Um, my most moving one of those, again, a very, very uh, large gentleman, and his mum came up, and um, she said, this is my son, you know, much, he, I don't know how old he is now, 30. <coughs> And she said he he was he was uh, he's autistic and he was I was told he would never speak he he would never really communicate um, but he did like watching Doctor Who and so they put Doctor Who on and, and when he was four he toddled over to the television and he banged the screen and he went Dalek <laughs> and it was his first word and from that day on his speech developed and developed and developed and you can now have you know a very reasonable conversation with this man he's got a life and it's and it's the Daleks <laughs> <laughs> that brought him to life yes. That must have been for the dad, that moment where he thought, ah, victory, he's not, his word, first words are not going to be mama, they're going to be dad, oh, darling. Oh, this is very, very disappointing. But, but that, you must write that book, I think that would be a wonderful yeah. book, because I think, again, we need as many things of, of, of humanity and kindness when the media is so filled with kind of the vile and venality, and, and I think that, again, this is what's great about these gatherings. And when did you first start, because, I mean, you are so, still, so incredibly busy, um, with other work. When did you first start going to kind of conventions? I think my first one was 1979, which would have been the year after. Oh no, maybe I was still in it at Longleat. Someone here might know better than me. I did a convention at Longleat, similar size gathering, you know, in a hall. Yeah, and well, mainly I sat on the edge of the stage and listened to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> and, and when did your relationship with him change then? When, when, when was the point? It changed dramatically in the 90s um, when he, uh, we were, he, he didn't want to work for Big Finish initially, and they're an amazing company to work They don't pay very well, but apart from that, they're an amazing company to work with. They have fantastic duty of care, and they're, they're just very considerate and lovely. And he didn't want to work with them, and they do lovely lunches. And um, he didn't want to work with them, so I just fired him an email going, they're wonderful, just give them one shot. There's a load of scripts waiting for you that I think you'll love. And uh, anyway, he did. And um, we were in the booth, back to back, you know, him with his mic, me with mine. <laughs> and Nick Briggs said, is there anything you'd like to say to mark this iconic moment of the Doctor and Leela coming back together? And there was this pause and I went, Nah. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed. And then, and so the ice was like, you know, well and truly smashed. And then later, after that, we were doing, um, we were chatting, I think, Face of Evil. You know, where they get you to watch the programme and talk about it while you watch it. And that goes on as an extra onto the DVD. And uh, he said, so this would have been around the same time, I guess, maybe a bit later, he said, I wasn't very nice to you, was I? And I went, no. And he went, I'm so sorry. And it was, you know, that was recorded, that was in front of everybody, and, and I just, really just, you know, I actually love him. I never thought that, that sentence would come out of my mouth, but I love the man. It seems like you know those displays of humanity as well when he talks about Elizabeth Slade and other things. But your your career has has been an incredibly strong career. I mean, you you. Well, one thing I want to talk about was the. Uh, I never know whether it's Omega or Omega. What do you prefer, Omega Factor? Omega. Omega Factor, right? We, were, we so, so. had to say Omega at the time, didn't we? That's Did we what say I was... Omega? I can't remember. Did we say Omega? Omega. 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 Because that is so the Omega. I was wrong on both counts. There we go. So, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So the Omega Factor, which. 
which is, uh, and, and now because of this whole thing of the haunted generation, like the people of similar age to me now, the 40 and times, that you know, the whole of the 1970s, Children of the Stones, and, and then it seems that the 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 uh, the, the thingy factor uh, has, uh, you know, that that now has seems to have a new life to it as well, because a lot of people have called it, you know, a precursor to. Uh, the uh, X Files and all of those things. So, so going into again a, a kind of genre piece. X Files without the budget, wasn't it? Yeah, really? yeah, basically. Yes, very much a genre piece. And you know why we didn't do a second series? Mary Whitehouse. Yeah. 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 Apparently, she had way back in the day. She really did. So yeah, sadly we didn't do one. There's a spooky story there. Should I tell you my yeah. spooky story? So there was one point where. Jimmy Hazeldean, the wonderful late great Jimmy, um, had to uh, have his character had to be taken over by the devil, and of course no CGI back in the day. And it took it was a very long uh, piece of special effect that we had to do where we um, in, where we laid the devil's face over Jimmy's and it kind of morphed, um, and it took a while. But the second we achieved it, the entire studio had a black hat. <laughs> <laughs> And it was dark for four and a half hours, and it was the only studio where the electricity didn't work. I know, it's spooky, right? Nobody ever found out why. I came back on, everything was fine. Special effect work. Creepy. Clearly. Uh, I think it's Nigel Neal in the next door studio. I'm plugging you. Uh, I'll take that to Brian, see what he's yeah. saying. Oh, that Brian Cox. He makes it all up. He just has an earpiece from Jim Al Khalili. The, uh, <laughs> Just because Jim lost his hair, that's the only reason he's not the front man. It's the old broadcast news scenario. The, uh, but, and then Tenko, which seems like such an important piece of television. To, to have an entirely, you know, female dominated guy, prime time. And, and it had a huge amount of impact, I think, on a lot of younger people who were eventually going to become writers and going to become actors, seeing, again, the, 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 this proper potential of real, full, rounded characters. Jill Hyam and Anne Valerie, um, amazing writers. I mean, Jill kind of became the go-to female writer for television. You know, when it was, oh, we better get a woman in here, let's get Jill. She kind of flew after Tenko, and not quite so much, but it was devised by a woman, written by women, for women, about women who'd actually existed. It was set in a, for those of you that don't know, set in a Japanese prisoner of war camp. I was talking about it yesterday, actually. They weighed us, they wouldn't be allowed to do this now. We had to sign a thing saying we wouldn't put on any weight. I got pregnant on them twice. <laughs> um, and the first time they were around and the second time they had to let me go, which is why I only, sadly only did two series because it was the, my most favorite job ever, ever. Forgive me, Doctor. God. But Tenko is right up there. Um, and we were weighed in every morning. And it was written on the chart. So you were, I mean, shamed if you'd put on a pound. They said three of us to Weight Watchers. I mean, it was, it was really serious stuff. That would have been quite an interesting one if they had kept you in for the third series, Pregnant, with Blanche, you know, how exactly did that happen in the camp? I mean, that yeah. was... Well, <laughs> yeah, she was a prostitute with the guards, so... Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> but but that, that is, uh, I mean, it's interesting because Mark Gates, of course, absolutely, you know, loves that and you've worked with him since. Yeah. When did you start to find, because of course there's a whole generation of people who, you know, they were fans, who then become quite powerful in television. And they turn to people like you and go, wow, well, we want to get you into this M.R. James story. You know, so, so your relationship with people like Mark Gates, when did, when did that start? I met Mark at a Doctor Who convention in L.A. It was the, is it the galley yeah. in L.A.? Yeah, yeah, I met him there. I mean, he literally kind of elbowed people out of the way <laughs> <laughs> to come and talk to me and kind of blocked everybody out. And we just had this very long chat. And his first question was, what's Tom Baker like to work with? So. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, that's where I first met him. And then, as you say, yeah, two or three times since, now he's of George III and... Uh, Jack Tate Middle. Yeah. Ooh. The James story. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah, I love working with him. Really love him. I tried to get him to write something for me, but I got like, no, I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think yeah, yeah, I think it'd be better in that Francis Barber role as well in the on friend at the moment. There you go. Stuff, but I'm not gonna say any more that. <laughs> the, um, so so also you you have incredible drive. I mean that's the thing that I, I think which you, you don't you never seem to be someone who's sitting there waiting for a job. 
you see this and we're going, right, what can I create? What can I do if there's any interim period? Is that fair? That's very fair. And it's a, it's a sort of blessing and a curse. And I'm, I'm, um, I've recently become very uh, fascinated by neurodiversity. And I sus I've not had any diagnosis or anything, but I suspect there's... I mean, there's a kind of constant scrambled egg in my brain that, that's thinking of other things and... and uh, I recently, this is, this is quite a dark story, forgive me, but I recently, there was a lad trying to commit suicide in Tunbridge Wells. He was standing the wrong side of the bridge. And it's okay, it's got a happy ending. He was pulled back and it was fine. But I, I, and I won't go through the whole process of getting him back. But, and, and it was very shocking and incredibly upsetting. And, um, but immediately I'm going, oh, TV series, no. I can't go, no, that character can do it. And already my brain is off, but I think if you are creative, to, de to deal with tragedy, uh, nothing's wasted, is what I'm trying to say. That it, even if you have the most awful experiences, there is a, there's a way of release, and with the release comes helping other people in similar circumstances. I think it's such an important thing. It's interesting you talk about neurodiversity because I know, there are, you know, I definitely know there are some people in this room anyway because I know them who have had diagnoses and something. And it, and I think the, the the freedom for a lot of people again, a lot of the people who are the weirdos and the freaks at school, and you know, and then when you find your own people, and you can just run at incredible speed through your thoughts and go and say hello, how are you? How was your Christmas? How's Jean? Oh, that's a long way to fall. You know, whatever it is, you know, you don't have to have those conversations. You just go straight in. And, and I think so many people go through depression and, uh, you know, melancholy and all of those things. And actually it's just that they've, they're, they're, I think if society, this is the thing that I reckon with ADHD, is I don't think ADHD is really a condition. I think the condition is a society which expects people to be far too normal and people are far too scared and a lot of people keep it in. So now we call it ADHD, but actually I think it's having an exciting brain and perhaps society needs to catch up. You know. I, do, you, I, I, I really think you have a point, and I think the, the fundamental problem lies with education because it's run along military lines rather than um, rather than pupil led. If it was pupil led, you can bring in all the. If someone likes cooking, then you can bring in you can bring in chemistry and science and all that into cooking. But in the meantime, you're making a cake. But you're le you're learning all the geography, where the ingredients come from. You can bring all that stuff in, but the, the, the child is doing something that they absolutely adore doing, which is cooking. So you find a way of embracing, which is why I'm so cross that they're stopping drama in schools, because if you stultify the child's play, you stultify the adult that grows up. And even if you don't want to go on the stage, it gives you the confidence to walk into an interview. You know, relax your shoulders, take your breath. You know, you're taught these things to be able to carry yourself with confidence, even if inside you're going <gasps> <laughs> So I think drama is, it should be right up there, along with the maths and science and all the other stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, the drama and critical thinking, I think are very, you know, things that should be. Um, I always wanted to ask you about, because I started off asking you about comedy, and I know you did a stand-up course, and you, you did a set, and what, what, when, when did you think about doing stand-up? It's terrifying. <laughs> It's I honestly don't know how, but I really, do, I'm lost in admiration because I'm an actor that um, hones obsessively. I even know where I'm going to breathe. I think once you've got all the technique sussed you can, and you don't have to think about the next line, you know it so well, then you are completely liberated to go anywhere with the text. Um, but with, with, so I do that with a stand-up my little stand-up that I had, and it went down quite well, it was lovely. But that's it, that's your, that's your material gone, you've got to do that all over again. And it, the writing of it is, I don't, I mean, where, where do the ideas come from? And the, I just think it's extraordinary. And I'm kind of drawn towards the dark when I, when I write. Uh, I don't know why that is, you know, like this, poor lad that tried to commit suicide. I've got a real TV series just mulling for my writing. And I, how can I make that funny? I am thinking, how can I make that funny? And it's uh, it's it's tough because you need the you need the comedy beside the tragedy. You need the red beside the green to make both colours zing, don't you? So you need the comedy beside the tragedy. 
And um, yeah, mixing and matching that, I, I couldn't do it for a living. I, oh, that's a pity. I think it would make a great show. <laughs> this is, the Edinburgh Fringe waits for you. There is a room waiting for you. This is, it's like when you talk about the dark, Daniel Sloss, I don't know if you've seen his work, yeah. which is, because we have a lot of people who are called edgy comics, and normally they're just like kind of men who are punching down at people who are already oppressed. And But then there are people like Daniel Sloss who really do deal with death and deal with, uh, you know, and, and it's, I, I remember writing about, I was once asked by a woman who'd, who'd lost her daughter to said, write some stuff about suicide and put it in your, and it's a really hard thing to, to write about. And then I spoke to someone who gave me the first kind of line. He said, you don't know that I tried to kill myself on three occasions. He said, I'm fine now. He said, but I'll give you a little bit of the idea of the mindset. He said, I went to kill myself uh, on a Friday. And I suddenly thought, hang on, don't kill yourself on Friday. You'll miss the weekend. <laughs> Do it on Sunday. <laughs> and that is such a remarkable insight. And oh, come on, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on then. That's your... Now, we better take some questions from the audience as well. We have a question over there. Um, probably the most moving scenes that came out of the pandemic was um, Mary and Emmerdale talking about her neighbour and it slowly gripped the that she started a lesbian affair with her neighbour who died. I wondered how that scene came about, how involved were you in the writing and the performance of that? I, well, thank you for that question. I wasn't involved in the writing at all. I was presented with it. When I went for my, so I was offered the part of Mary, Rona's mum, um, and that was it. I went, yes, please. Uh, and I hadn't seen a text or had a character chat or anything. And then I went for the character chat and I was going to say, can we make her vibrant and active and, you know, uh, sexy and all those things because I'd recently done a Doctors and I'd done a Holby City and they see the white hair and they give you a cardigan and a Zimmer frame. And, 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 anyway, I just wanted to represent someone. And I hadn't drawn breath before the producer said, so, Mary's a latent lesbian. She's going to come out in six months. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, well that's, yes, active, yes, active, okay. <laughs> So I had I had no idea. So the, those scenes where I talk about a woman that I love that I was too frightened to say uh, hello to or you know profess my love to um, were, were the lead up to that story of coming out. I had a text recently from a very very dear uh, male gay friend of mine who said what you're doing on Emmerdale is. You know, he said lovely things, and then he said, because when I was growing up, all we had were carry-on jokes. So we were either sent up or beaten up in stories. There was never any kind of normalising of, of being gay. So, I, and I was very touched by that, because I, I think soap, you know, for all its faults, is a very important place to discuss dangerous issues. It's a very safe place to discuss dangerous issues, and... Uh, uh, and and is something should be a mirror uh, for society. I and mean, it does go over the top. We sat doing a scene yesterday we, when we had um, um, Marlon and uh, Rona. They've got nine marriages between them. <laughs> <laughs> they live in a village. So, I mean, that is the land of soap. But nevertheless, each one of those divorces told a very interesting and, and, and pertinent and poignant story en route. I think that's a, such an important thing when you talk about how sometimes older characters are written. And because I, I find sometimes when I play an audience, I look out and I, I never try and prejudge, but I was playing Tiverton and, uh, and the bookshop had said, just so you know, there might be some quite right wing people. I said, well, I do what I do and we'll see what happens. And then there was a, a, just a little group of middle aged uh, well, uh, women, I think actually in their, in their 80s. And I thought, oh, I wonder if they're going to be the ones. I thought, well, it doesn't matter. And they seem to be smiling. And then, of course, afterwards they come and they're so funny because I, I spent most of my life in London and uh, I was married, I had five kids. And then I came to Tiverton and immediately I realised I was a lesbian.